Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, it's really great to see everyone turn out on a, on a cold and misty uh, British evening uh, to talk about the morality of tax. Now, we talk about the economics of tax policy, we talk about various social effects of tax policy all the time, but there's also uh, that related question of the morality of tax, and is it fair, is it fair to be levying ever higher rates on people uh, we often hear the, the debate cast as one, as one between efficiency and fairness, as a debate between uh, what's really right and what we might have to do in the meantime. Uh, but there is, I think, a deeper you know, moral debate to be had over tax. Uh, that debate's what uh, Richard and uh, Amy are talk about this evening. It's a debate essentially over um, uh, how you know, the economics effects of tax, the social effects of tax, uh, affects the ethics of, it, of, of the question, but also about whether beyond that there's any moral, moral importance in changing. So, so uh, we're taking money, people's money away so they can't spend this supporting their own families, their own causes, and instead saying we'll spend it to support uh, causes we've decided on politically. What's the moral import of that? So, uh, two speakers we've got this evening couldn't be better qualified to talk about this issue. Uh, firstly, Richard Barron is going to set the scene. Now, he has two hats, uh, and two hats which make him pretty uniquely qualified. For this <laughs> firstly, he's a teacher and author of books on uh, philosophy. So he's written uh, two, two books, uh, Deliberation and Reason and Projects and Values, and indeed he teaches uh, philosophy. So he spends half his time doing that. The other half of his time he spends as head of taxation at the Institute of Directors. And he's also works at uh, other firms and at um, the uh, HMRC. So he's worked on both sides, of, so both as poacher and gamekeeper uh, in, in, with, with regards to tax. Uh, and, and come out, despite all of that, uh, sensible. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, so I, I, I was going to say, you know, we talk about philosopher kings. Richard is that rare species of philosopher accountant. But uh, people, people. Uh, Eamon uh, is the director and co-founder of the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, he's written a number of books which are a brilliant introduction to some of the great thinkers of uh, classical liberal and libertarian uh, thought. Uh, through Friedman, von Mises, uh, Austrian economics in general, uh, and Adam Smith. But he's also written his own work, so uh, most recently, The Alternative Manifesto, uh, looking at um, a, a, pro a program offered by none of the political parties, which might do something more serious about the problems facing Britain today. Uh, he's done a lot of work at the Adam Smith Institute, building up to ensure that the homeland of Adam Smith uh, honours uh, one of, it, one of you know, the, the original and the great economist. Uh, because, uh, partly as a result of that, he was uh, honored with honorary doctorates uh, from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. But we're going to start with Richard, who's going to set the scene, talking to us about the morality of tax for about 10 minutes, and Amy's going to talk about 10 minutes, then we'll open up for a good discussion, we'll get you all involved as much as possible in this debate this evening. Uh, Richard. Thanks very much, Matt. So my task is really, as Matt said, to give an overview. Really, I want to show two things. Firstly, that there are good ethical reasons to have tax rates that are lower than we're used to in the UK. Although, within that heading, I'm not going to tie myself down too much to specific numbers. I'm going to limit myself to a positive ethical case for rates that you'd need to finance public spending of something like a third of GDP. Now, you could make an ethical case for a lower level, and I don't claim that one third of GDP is the right answer, but I'm only going to argue that it's the highest plausible answer. The reason why I'm going to stop that point is that it gets more complicated to make an ethical argument for something significantly lower. In particular, the utilitarian case gets quite a lot more challenging. Second thing I want to argue is that tax arrangements that might look unethical because they don't pay much attention to equality of outcome can be perfectly ethical. You know, we might think some people do think the tax system should do a lot to promote equality but I'm going to argue that the promotion of equality is not ethically essential. And that's a conclusion worth reaching, because it allows us to follow the recommendations of economists as to what works, for example, how lower taxes promote growth, and tax systems which may incidentally permit a high degree of inequality can be good for growth, without fearing that the result will necessarily be unethical. So let's start with the total amount of tax. I'll draw on two pretty standard main schools of ethical thought, 
First one, utilitarianism, where the concern is the production for greatest total happiness, which in terms of e in the economic sphere is going to be maximising the satisfaction of desires. And then secondly, virtue ethics, where we look at the virtues that we should have in order to live a good life. And here we're going to need a pretty broad conception of virtues. So not just virtues like honesty, but virtues like using your talents and leading a fulfilled life. And then, having gone through those two, I'll look at some political arguments. So what's the utilitarian going to say about the total amount of tax? Well, the economic goals are going to be to have enough goods and services available for everyone to have a decent life. So resources will need to be distributed widely enough for all or most people to enjoy them. Now, the true utilitarian is actually concerned with the total amount of satisfaction rather than with its evenness of distribution. But when it comes to taxation, we're actually talking about distribution of resources. That's the thing immediately affected by taxation. And if each person has modest resources, that's going to give you more satisfaction in total than if the same total resources are concentrated in the hands of a few people. So taxation plus government spending starts to look like a good idea. After all, it achieves redistribution and ensures everybody gets something. But there is this uncomfortable tension, isn't there? Taxation and spending may give you wide resource distribution, but high rates of tax reduce investment, reduce incentives, make it hard to generate sufficient total resources. If you have too much redistribution, you end up with too small a pie to share out, and carving up a very small pie equally isn't actually a terribly satisfactory outcome. So utilitarians have to strike a balance. And it's economists, I think, pretty plainly, who are the ones to tell us how to do this balancing. The consensus seems to be, not shared by everybody, but shared by enough sensible people, that spending, state spending of about one-third of GDP is roughly the revenue-maximising level. Now, that's not an exact conclusion. Of course, there's an area of uncertainty. But certainly above that level, you get into waste, you get into state expanding itself in order to benefit the people who work in it, and you start to have really significant impacts on economic growth, adverse impacts. So on a utilitarian basis, I think one could say something like, Public spending of a third of GDP is the maximum plausible level. Turning now to the virtue ethics this now, well, virtue ethics actually can very easily lead to the conclusion that tax levels ought to be kept down. Several virtues are more likely to be exercised if tax levels are moderate than if they're on the high side. For example, the virtue of using your talents to the full. Financial incentives, <coughs> sorry, financial incentives will point you in that direction but very high taxation will dampen those incentives. Or there's the virtue of charity, whether it's in cash or in time. If your take-home pay is higher, you more, feel more able to make charitable donations. And if you've got a decent take-home pay rate, you'll find it easier to take time off to do things like be a magistrate or a school governor or something like that. Another virtue which we could mention is the virtue of independence. It's good to earn what you need rather than to rely on subsidies from other people. Of course, lower rates of taxation make independence easier to achieve. Now I'll just turn to explore one or two political arguments. Um, some of you will be familiar with a very famous book that came out in that famous among philosophers anyway, <laughs> book that came out in 1974 by a guy called Robert Nozick, called Anarchy, State and Utopia. And he came out with a very strong anti-tax line. He said, hang on, if you impose taxation, that's a violation of people's rights. He said, well, property gets shared out by a series of acquisitions a long time ago and then a series of exchanges since. And if those acquisitions were free and fair and the exchanges have since been voluntary, then the distribution of property you've got now as a result of that process is just. And it would be unjust to interfere with that distribution by force and taxation would be a form of interference by force. If people individually agree to pay for things like a police force, that's fine, but the majority shouldn't force the unwilling minority to contribute. Now, there's an interesting, I think, the most interesting challenge to that kind of line of argument comes from a book that came out in 2002 by Liam Murphy and Thomas Nagel called The Myth of Ownership. And they said, uh-uh, you shouldn't think in terms of a natural distribution of income and wealth and the tax levying state interfering with that distribution. Because, they said, the state gives the stability that allows high incomes. If there was a world without government... There'd be no security of property, there'd be no system of enforceable contracts, and therefore overall levels of wealth would be a lot lower than they actually are. So we shouldn't say that existing wealth will be distributed differently without a state, and then the state sticks its nose in and interferes with that. They say 
that existing wealth mostly would not exist without an income state. I think that's true. But it's not enough to legitimise high levels of taxation. Suppose we had a minimal state which provides security and a legal framework for business, but nothing more, so no state benefits, no state schools, state hospitals, state roads, all of that would be provided privately. The distribution of income and wealth in that society would be very different from what we've actually got, but the total income and wealth might not be so different. So someone taking a Nozick type line could come back and say, well, that distribution with a minimal state should be assumed to be just, and coercive interference by taxation to create a bigger state than that minimal state would be unjust. Now, that response doesn't show in itself that a big state would be wrong, but I think it does put the pressure back on those who advocate a big state to show it would be justified despite the coercion involved. So that worry about coercion is still there. And that should caution us against high taxation, <coughs> as indeed, as I said, utilitarian and virtue ethics approaches caution us against high taxation. So that's levels of taxation. Now I want to turn to this question of equality in the ethical acceptability of a tax system. Because tax and increased equality often go together. Tax can easily be used in a way that makes distributions of income and wealth more equal. You provide cash benefits, that transfers cash from the rich to the poor, increases equality. You provide a national health service, that redistributes income because we can all use it and get the same standard of health care from it, but we pay different amounts for it depending on our income. Same goes for state education. And, of course, education for everyone could help the poor to improve their lot, increasing equality. <coughs> so increased equality can be very easy, an accidental outcome of using the tax system to do these other things. But it can also be a goal in itself. Question, is there an ethical requirement to pursue equality through taxation? Well, there might be a utilitarian argument for greater economic equality. If more equal societies are happier, more stable, have lower crime rates and so on, the only utilitarian will say, yeah, promote equality, as long as it doesn't interfere too much with other goals. Well, we have to let the sociologists tell us whether more equal societies do have those advantages. But I have to say, the most famous stu recent study argument that they do, this is the spirit level by uh, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett, has been very heavily criticised, both for the quality of its data and for the quality of its arguments. So I think the jury's out on that one. Now, you could also argue for equality on different grounds, non-utilitarian grounds. In particular, you could argue for it on the basis of justice. The argument would be roughly, if there's no positive justification for people receiving unequal shares of the available resources, then they should receive equal shares, otherwise the injustice is done to those who get less. A leading spokesman for this is John Rawls in his book A Theory of Justice, which first came out in 1971, then a revised edition in 1999. What he said was inequality should be arranged so that the greatest benefit is gained by the people with the fewest advantages. So he says, yeah, inequality is fine. They may well benefit the people at the bottom of a heap, and that's perfectly sensible, yeah? For example, you may find that inequalities are a necessary result of putting in place the financial incentives or allowing the financial incentives to arise will encourage skilled people to work hard, <coughs> entrepreneurial people to take risks, so long as the result is to help the people at the bottom of the heap. And that's fine. That looks sensible. Why not let the rich grow richer if the poor are helped? Well, that's good as far as it goes. But do note that Rawls' view of acceptable inequality is still pretty restrictive. All inequalities would need to be justified on his basis, that they benefit the people at the bottom. Perhaps Rawls can make that case if he can establish this basic premise that equality is in principle more just than inequality. But it's not clear that we should accept that premise. Now, I won't try to prove that we positively should reject it, but I will argue that one of the leading arguments for the premise is defective. If we considered other arguments for the premise, we might find defects in them too. The leading argument is one that Rawls uses. He says, well, how are we going to work out what kind of distribution, what means of distribution is just? Right, suppose you're designing a society. It's going to have some equalities, inequalities, whatever. You're going to be in that society, so you have, a say, as they say, got some skin in the game, but you have no idea who you're going to be. You have no idea what advantages you have, what family background, <coughs> what talents, anything like that. Yeah? In that situation, he says, you could expect nothing better than an average share, and you have no reason to expect anything worse than an average share. So you would choose an egalitarian society, subjects is let out for inequalities that make things better for the person at the bottom of the heap. But I don't think that work, argument works. Yeah? Suppose you've got two alternative societies to choose between, X and Y. In X, uh, and nobody in any of these societies, in either of these societies, is in like, abject poverty. You're not running that risk. 
Society X, the worst off person, has income of 15,000 a year. A few people have income of 20,000 a year, and most people have income of 25,000 a year. In Society Y, the, lowest, the worst off person has 14,000 a year instead of 15. A few people have 19 instead of 20, but most people have 27,000 in instead of 25, yeah? Now, if you've got to make a choice and you don't know who you're going to be, I put it to you, you could very well <coughs> take a chance on being in the average, in the majority group, and say, well, I'll go up 27 and 25, so I'll plump for society Y, even though the worst point in society Y is worse than in society X, because I'll probably be better off in society Y. I think Rawls was wrong to assume that you must rationally prefer society X. So I'd suggest that the case for promoting equality that's based on justice is pretty weak, and therefore we may be excused from requiring the tax system to make a big thing about pursuing equality for its own sake. So in conclusion, when we're ethically free to choose tax systems that the economists tell us will work, systems that impose moderate, moderate overall burdens, we might pick a tax-to-GDP ratio of something like one-third or perhaps lower, but we shouldn't, on ethical grounds, have higher <coughs> burdens, and that we don't need to include massive redistribution in pursuit of equality. So on that liberating note, I shall hand over to Eamon. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Richard. Uh, from uh, from Nozick to Rawls in 11 minutes. I mean, you're, you're going perhaps in the wrong direction, but it's still an impressive form of travel. Uh, so, uh, thank you for that. Now, Eamon is going to uh, talk to us about uh, what's about some of the moral arguments. I'm going to develop that further on from Richard's talk about. So, give a give a give a more of a particular perspective on the morality of tax, maybe. Uh, yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, Richard, I think, is one of these people who thinks that we should all pay our tax with a smile. Um, in fact, I tried that, but they wanted cash. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I accept this uh, redistributionist um, argument, really. Uh, I think a, a lot of this is people look at the UK and they look at America and they say how, uh, well, we're a higher tax country, but we're much more equal, and what a good thing that is. Um, in fact, these statistics, I think Dan might know more about it than I, I do, but um, uh, basically what you tend to be comparing in these statistics is the post-tax uh, distribution in uh, the UK and post-benefit distribution in the UK with pre-benefit distribution uh, in the US, because the US doesn't actually keep, keep figures on post-benefit uh, distributions. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not actually sure that taxation does the job of making uh, a more equal society anyway. And uh, uh, you know, I also have objections to, to Rawls, uh, because I think that, the, that he completely ignored the, the dynamism of society, that you might very well say, I'd be very happy to live in a society where people have at least the opportunity of changing their status and becoming rich, um, rather than one which is equal uh, but, but fixed so that we're all in the, in the same place. Um, uh, a, third, a third of the national income going in tax? Goodness. If Adam Smith had been told that even a third of the national income uh, was going in taxation to be spent by the government, he would have thought this to be the greatest tyranny in the history of the world. Um, he, uh, you know, this is how our, um, yeah, we slide. If we, we get used to high levels of taxation, and that becomes the norm for the next round. Uh, and and uh, when you look at it objectively, what is it that governments really have to do? Uh, plainly, they have to have some input, not necessarily to provide, but to make sure that things like defence uh, and policing and justice are provided. They don't necessarily have to do, that, do it themselves. Uh, and indeed, to make sure uh, that uh, people do not fall by the, the wayside <coughs> for, for no fault of their own. Um, but um, couldn't we do that on about a tenth rather than about a third? You know, the, the biblical tenth, the tithes? Um, that is a, a sort of sum of money which people will voluntarily uh, give up. Uh, a third isn't. A, a third you have to extract from people, or more, you have to extract from people by force. And that's my first uh, concern about taxation, uh, that tax is coercive. Uh, we'll all give up, we'd all happily give up a little bit of our income, uh, for, for these benefits, but when you've got politicians taking a third or a fourth or a, or, 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 or a half, um, then you need coercion. And coercion is an evil 
and we should have as little coercion as possible. And as Matt said, uh, it's coercion by people who believe that their values should uh, prevail, not ours. Uh, that it forces people to pay for things which they morally disapprove of extremely strongly. Uh, some people are against abortion, they're against foreign wars, um, they are against bank bailouts, and yet their money is taken from them and spent in their name on things that they find totally morally offensive. And I think it's dismal to live in a state where my money is being taken to spend on things which I think are actually a moral outrage. Taxation also robs people of choice because the, the people who are making the decisions basically are making decisions on, on, on our behalf in our stead. And I don't think that we can really be whole moral human beings unless we make our own decisions. If somebody else makes all your decisions for you, or as we have it now, half your decisions are made for you, you know, half your income is spent by somebody else, um, then it seems to me that um, we, we have become mere ciphers. We're not actually whole human beings. And so I think tax undermines personal responsibility. It shuffles responsibility. Uh, because we look at all of the tax that's being spent, you know, half of our income is going in taxation, and we think, well, um, in that case, responsibility should, should be uh, passed on to the state. Um, if my kids can't read, it's not my fault, it's the teacher's. Um, if there's uh, violence in the street, it's got nothing to do with me, the police are falling down on their job, social workers are falling down on their job. After all, you know, we all pay enough, so um, I think, that, again, this is morally corrosive, because... It, it makes us rely on these state agencies rather than taking responsibility ourselves. Taxation also crowds out um, private philanthropy and private giving. Uh, the Royal National Lifeboats Institution, which is a charity I support, one of the few charities I support, because it doesn't take any government money. And uh, it was founded in 1824, and uh, by 1854, 30 years later, it had run out of cash. So they started taking government grants, and they took government grants of £2,000 a year. And they discovered that for every uh, pound that they got from the government, they lost what the equivalent of £1.50 today in private subscriptions. Because people looked at it and said, well, you know, if the government's paying for you, then, then why should I? If the government's got deeper pockets than I have. And so um, in 1869, they decided that they would stop taking uh, government donations, and they have never taken them since, and that is one of the reasons why I give to the National Lifeboat Institution. Um, Richard mentioned the various impacts of high tax on, on uh, the social structure, and it's very interesting that high tax countries are less generous philanthropically um, than uh, low tax countries. The, the United States, a low tax country, generally speaking, a low tax country, um, spends roughly twice as much per head on charity than, than we do. Okay, they're richer, but even so, it's twice as much. Uh, and you get people like, you know, Carnegie and Soros, who's given away seven billion, and, and the Gates Foundation and so on. If you have low taxation, you can afford to do that. You can, you can accumulate wealth, and you can afford to give it away, and people do. I think you should also remember that politicians and officials have their own interests. When tax is taken from us, it is not spent dispassionately on things that promote the public interest. It is spent on things which politicians and officials believe it ought to be spent on. And they have their own political, personal, and, and moral agenda, which doesn't necessarily match ours. And I think it promotes interest group politics, because you've got this wadge of public cash, and uh, people are vying for their share of it and they want other people to pay. So uh, it, it's morally corrosive because it makes us think of ourselves as being groups which are supplicants uh, to the state, and let's get our bit and stop everybody else getting theirs. Uh, taxation is also um, inefficient. You know, when you're spending your own money on yourself, you're very interested in the quality and you're very interested in the cost. When you're spending somebody else's money, on somebody else, then you're not very interested in the quality and you're not very interested in the cost. That is why we have such shoddy public services. <laughs> it's why they cost too much. And I think people look at that and it promotes a certain scepticism in, in government. Um, I saw my first Christmas tree today. 
It's coming. I, tell, I warn you. I warn you now. It's coming. And uh, there was a survey a couple of years ago, a few years ago, um, on how much do people value presents. And the answer is, if you give somebody uh, a present, you know, uh, and it costs um, ten pounds, what? What is the value they they would put? How much do they think it's worth? And the answer is, they think that it's worth roughly, four, on average, fourteen percent less than it actually cost you. You'd be better giving them the cash, right? They'd appreciate that more. Um, and I think it is exactly the same with public services that we are given these public services, and we actually v value them less than they cost. Partly because they cost too much anyway, they are inefficiently delivered. But even if they were efficiently delivered, we wouldn't value them as much as we would value the cash, because we would look at the cash and we'd spend it on the things that we want, not the things that they want. And so people come to regard tax as confiscation. And then they regard the government as being an agent of confis uh, confiscation, uh, as being pirates, basically. Uh, and that is no way to generate respect for the law uh, and, uh, and decency. Um, I, I think high taxes in particular uh, encourage uh, evasion and, um, and avoidance. Um, as Will Rogers, the American uh, uh, humorist, said that uh, income tax has made more liars out of Americans uh, than even golf. Uh, and uh, as Adam Smith said, there, there is no uh, there is no art, said Adam Smith, which uh, one government sooner learns from another uh, than that of draining the pockets of the people. Uh, and in many parts of the country, you have uh, a situation where 60, 70, 80 uh, percent, even uh, in Wales, uh, owe their living to to the government rather than to uh, uh, the private sector. The, the poor pay most is another moral problem with taxation, partly because there's more of them, but also they face very high marginal tax rates, just the, the way the benefit system works as much as anything. That, I, I think, again, is, uh, is, is uh, morally reprehensible. And um, as Richard said, taxes do, in the long run, reduce human prosperity. So I think uh, we should save uh, trees and uh, stop printing tax forms. Uh, high taxes are not moral and generous and the marks of a good society. They are on, on the contrary, they are coercive, they undermine responsibility, they crowd out private giving, they're divisive, they're inefficient uh, and uh, morally corrosive. Thank you. If, if you're on Eamon's Christmas list, the <laughs> surprise has been ruined. Uh, but, um, I think there's another added component there, which is there's a question not just of whether tax is moral or immoral, or a certain level of tax is moral or immoral, but also what impact do taxes have uh, on society, and, ha and, and how does that lead us to behave in more or less moral ways, which I think is a really important part of our discussion this evening. Now, I think we've had a lot of perspectives come up. We've heard philosophy come out, so we've heard religious perspectives come out, we've heard good old homespun common sense come out, so there's different aspects of this. So there's a whole range of perspectives here, and that's why we want to set a good amount of time uh, to hear from all of you about what you think about the morality of tax. Now, I'm not going to ask that everything ends in a question, statements are fine, mm -hmm. but I will ask uh, to be, that, that, you, that you be concise, that way we can get as many people as possible involved in this and make it a bit more of a discussion and a bit less of everyone uh, making their speech. But I think Eamon and Richard have given us a brilliant introduction. So now, does anyone else have anyone thing to add to, or, or to question or to challenge about what they've said? <laughs>